I am pleased to be able to uh, talk to you about the Uyghur atrocities, even though the topic, the nature of the discussion, the issues involved um, sound disparaging uh, uh, and to the extent uh, depressing. But we have to talk about this. Uh, recently, I was uh, speaking with one of the key congressional leaders uh, in the United States Senate. And he said he was surprised that people are not screaming, screaming from the rooftop after hearing about this dystopian uh, surveillance state that China set up for the Uyghur people. Um, I don't second guess your knowledge about who the Uyghurs are and about the Uyghurs' homeland. So I'm going to start with a little bit of an uh, introduction, um, background information. The Uyghurs are Turkic people, uh, predominantly residing in the area uh, that China calls Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, that Uyghurs call East Turkestan. Uh, the Uyghur people culturally, historically, uh, very close to the Eurasian uh, Turkic peoples, uh, particularly the Uzbek, uh, uh, Uzbek population in Uzbekistan, perhaps the closest uh, uh, to the Uyghurs in linguistic and cultural aspect. Um, and the Uyghurs also very, um, uh, ha have lots of commonality and share historic cultural background with the people in Turkey. Uh, the Chinese government source uh, states that the Uyghur population is about 12 million. Uh, they've been revising it. Uh, recently they put out a uh, um, population figure that close to 12 million. But the Uyghur uh, diaspora believes that number is much higher. Just one uh, quick example that uh, Kazakhstan has at least one million Uyghurs, and Uzbekistan probably has about uh, three to five million Uyghurs. So the, the worldwide Uyghur population can be anywhere between 20 to 25 million. Uh, for whatever reason that Chinese government likes to understate the Uyghur population. So the Uyghurs' physical appearances is a kind of combination of various uh, appearances. Some Uyghurs look Asian, some Uyghurs look uh, Slavic, some Uyghurs look Northern African, some Uyghurs look Mongol. So you will see a uh, very different type of uh, Uyghur physical appearances, just like the way that you see in the picture. Uh, what is holding the Uyghurs together is their culture. That's precisely why the Chinese government is uh, keen to um, stamp out that Uyghur cultural identity so that they can uh, prevent any potential political threat. The Uyghur people has a uh, uh, history of uh, building a nation, nation building history. Uh, they had two short lived republics uh, with the name East Turkestan, uh, twice in the uh, modern history the first time in 1933, the second time in 1944. That's the last uh, Uyghur uh, uh, government or a functioning government that the uh, Uyghur's ancestors were able to uh, establish. Uh, this is where I should mention the name East Turkestan. Calling the region East Turkestan is not suggesting separatism or something else. Uh, some people are so concerned about using this term that is favored by the Uyghurs to refer to as their homeland. Uh, simply because this history uh, makes Uyghurs feel nostalgic and uh, feel that this is an actual name for it before uh, Communist China gave Uyghurs the new name, uh, Xinjiang, which is New Dominion, New Frontier. That name in of itself suggests that it is a col colony. So <coughs> the, the, the Uyghur region is, uh, is a giant, is a huge land mass. It sits in the heart of the Central Asia, um, has a long international borders, um, which, um, and also sits in a large oil reserve. Because of this geographical location of the region, the, to the Chinese government, uh, this area is geostrategically uh, critical, especially today with the new initiatives, global initiatives that they have launched. This is some of the natural scenery. This just reminds you of some areas in the North America, uh, Pacific Northwest. Um, the gentleman on the left uh, is the uh, president of the East Turkestan Republic who get killed uh, when he was on his way to meet with uh, Mao Zedong to discuss the final status of the uh, East Turkestan Republic in 1949. The, his death uh, is still a mystery. Um, 
Uyghurs believe that he was assassinated in this mysterious air crash over the airspace of Kazakhstan. The ladies on the left were the uh, female soldiers of the East Turkestan Republic Army uh, back in 1940-49 before it was uh, um, uh, merged with the PLA. So I'm going to move on to the uh, more recent events. Uh, the, the Uyghurs, uh, traditionally known in the Chinese society as someone who's different, uh, speak different language, they, look di uh, they have a different lifestyle. Uh, oftentimes they just describe nanggo shan with meaning the Uyghurs are very good at dancing and singing, the Uyghurs produce good food, uh, fruits, and so, very uh, basic understanding. Even when I was going to school in inland China, when I <coughs> struck up a casual conversation with my classmates, they did not know much about who the Uyghurs are, why they uh, look different and lead a different lifestyle. But that um, uh, portrayal of the Uyghurs turned to a separatist, ter terrorist, uh, extremist since the 9-11 in particular. So they have a different uh, public perception. This is precisely why that it's so difficult to get sympathy from the Chinese, uh, ordinary Chinese people. Because of the state-run media changes narrative and created this uh, anxiety uh, in the minds of ordinary Chinese people and they literally uh, uh, take uh, how it's been described and, and act accordingly. So let's move on to the camps uh, since we're going to talk about technology. Uh, since uh, early 2017, we start hearing about the concentration camps that China calls uh, re-education camps. The reason that they built these camps uh, have been described in a three different or four different ways. One, China's geopolitical interest. Because this area is uh, geopolitically so significant, in order for China to get access to Eurasian market uh, through this BRI Belt and Road Initiative that spans to uh, seven, over 70 countries, to some Chinese officials, they need to create a stability, establish stability in this region. But uh, that also defeats, uh, that also uh, uh, it begs the question that since 2009, uh, the region was already uh, look, appear like a military zone. It was already uh, super secretive. Even some officials in the United States uh, call it one of the two safest uh, places in whole China. So, um, and the second reason is that they are, they're claiming that they're fighting against uh, three forces, extremism, terrorism, and separatism. And the other reason is more political. Uh, some policy experts believe that this is, has a lot to do with Xi Jinping's solid, so, so, uh, as, uh, Xi Jinping's sense of insecurity and his uh, struggle to maintain uh, political stability in, in, in the country. And finally, uh, uh, some experts, um, and I agree with that, uh, believe that there's a very strong uh, racist context in the uh, ongoing uh, repression. Because when you listen to the Chinese officials' narratives, they openly said that we're helping the Uyghurs to transform into a normal human being. This is Googleable information if you're interested. The U.S. Uh, the Ch Chinese ambassador to Washington, Sui Tiankai, told the reporters that that was the purpose of uh, his government setting up these camps. So around the same time, they also legislated something so draconian. Uh, when you look at it, it, it makes no sense whatsoever. And it shows you that this is like a wholesale repressive effort. And they call it a de-extremification measure. Uh, this, it was enacted in April 2000. Uh, 17, and these are the 48 behaviors uh, that was translated and posted on uh, China File and Foreign Policy magazine. There's, there's a phrase, uh, uh, what did you do? Did you violate any of the 48 um, behaviors or um, sins that got you into trouble? If you look at these um, uh, reasons that you end up being in a camp, uh, you will find something so um, incredible, having a full beard, for example. Smoking, uh, uh, or uh, not smoking, not drinking, and also uh, interfering your children's uh, love affairs with non-Uyghur individuals. So these kind of things are 
uh, are, uh, have been a part of the government per, uh, database that resulted in uh, collective punishment of the Uyghurs. Who do, they, who do they round it up in the camps? If they wanted to fight against terrorism, why would they lock up someone who, is, uh, who used to serve as the president of major university? Uh, soccer players, um, stage performing artists. So when you, these, these are just the tip of the iceberg. We compiled over 400 uh, academics, uh, well-known scholars, who have been sent to the camps. Um, if you're interested, we have a report in our website, uhrp.org, that you can get access to some names. And this lady on the upper right corner, she spent a lot of time in the United States. Uh, she's, uh, her name is Riley Davut. She, uh, New York Times profiled her, and she disappeared, and she has a daughter in Seattle, and she's been using social media to campaign for her mother's release, and we still don't know where she is. Uh, she has lots of colleagues in the United States. She's an, one of the well-known anthropologists uh, in China. So she's also been uh, part of this uh, Roundup campaign and disappeared. This is the way that they open these camps. It's very public. Um, the, the, if you look at the source of this information, it's from the Chinese government, and you can see even names of those camps. So sometimes when the, uh, the Chinese state-run uh, CGTN and Global Times said, oh, fake news, it's not fake news, it's what you were telling us. We're just repeating what you have said and what you put out in public. So this is how the camps look, look like. Uh, 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 from the outside, you can see the barbed wire uh, compound, the cameras, um, and this is the expansion of the camps. If you look at the 2018 versus, uh, to, uh, 2017 versus 2018, you see a significant uh, change um, like this. She is a camp survivor, lives in Washington, D.C. She testified in Congress and tell us a lot of, um, uh, a lot of things, especially what happens to Uyghur women in the prison camps, uh, in the concentration camps. Um, her information is also available publicly. So let's move on to that big topic. So what is the role of the technology in all of this? Uh, this is a Washington Post uh, editorial. I can't even keep track of the editorials being published in the Washington Post since the crisis comes to existence. Um, the, the, when you look at the, the first one is the Uyghur justice, I never thought that in my lifetime that I will see a Uyghur justice headline up at or editorial in a major newspaper. So Washington Post have been doing this kind of reporting. The, the reason is that initially people uh, compared to 1984 Big Brother, but now it's becoming much bigger issue. Why it's expanding. Eventually it's gonna be affecting the lives of everyone around the world, which I will get to it a little bit. So how is, how is the internet and smartphone in particular uh, aided, abated the Chinese government's uh, repressive policies in the Uyghur region? Um, the repression, uh, especially since 2009, uh, July 5, unrest in Rimchi, was ongoing. But in 2004, there was a dramatic change after Xi Jinping's visit to the region. So he was, he was displeased. Uh, he was to the extent angry that the Uyghur people have not been fully integrated into the Chinese society. In other words, he's not happy that the Uyghurs were uh, still talking, speaking Uyghur language, dressing up in a Uyghur outfit, because as a custom in China, when the Chinese leaders go to the uh, uh, local uh, uh, areas, they have to visit the uh, Uyghur families and take pictures to show this happy minority face. So one of his interactions, people could not understand what he was talking about. So that irritated him. Oh, this is China. Why these people cannot speak the language that I speak? So, and then it added some uh, security concerns. So there were, 2014 was the turning point. Um, if you look at the uh, report by uh, the New York Times in mid-November, uh, November 17 to be exact, it released uh, troves of uh, uh, internal documents. And in that document specifically mentioned how Xi Jinping, how profoundly, uh, intimately that uh, Xi Jinping was involved in this process, policy making and deliberation process. So since 2004, 2016, 2017, the, the technology uh, 
basically set the stage uh, for Chinese uh, officials to create this nightmare environment, both inside the camp and outside the camps. So how did we get to that point? Uh, initially, um, uh, initially uh, as you may know, some of you uh, uh, may, all, uh, may be still using uh, WeChat. WeChat was a so popular uh, tool which was the combination of WhatsApp, um, PayPal, Amazon, even uh, you know, face, Facebook. They, you can do a lot of stuff in there. Uh, even myself had a, a WeChat account during that period because that was easy to keep contact with uh, former classmates and friends who are still living in China. So it appears that the Chinese government let this open and available for the folks to use and that helped them to collect personal data. So today, when you look at some of the, uh, 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 the few ladies in this uh, picture that I showed you earlier, had connection to the United States. When they were in the United States, they made Uyghur friends. And they established this chat group on WeChat. Uh, that was identified by the Chinese government. And, and that two lady that, um, that I, I, um, I know personally end up in, a, in a concentration camps today simply because she was part of this chat group. There's a lot of chat groups. People thought that they can talk, they can send images, they can take, uh, you know, I've seen some of, some of those uh, postings and I thought there's a, uh, uh, the page called Moment. You can post stuff. I've seen, uh, I remember that um, there was posting about the US ambassador to China, Gary Locke. Uh, people criticizing him, sometimes people phrasing him, phrasing the United States for sending an Asian American, Chinese American as an ambassador to China. There's no, no, there's no go for you know, that kind of communication previously and now. So I was surprised that this is a very sensitive political discussion. A minority member of the United States citizen make it to the uh, ambassador position. That's significant. So that level of discussion was uh, pretty common. I even participated in this kind of discussion. But the, the people did not know that in the background, the government was developing uh, tracking uh, software to monitor their communication. Uh, and that resulted in them, uh, some of them being end up in the, gap, in the camp. So uh, starting in 2016, late 2016, with the arrival of a, uh, a brutal Chinese communist leader by the name Chen Zhuanguo, the, the entire landscape changed. So, so what does it look like now? So everywhere uh, you see video cameras with a facial recognition uh, software. Uh, whenever, uh, I'll show you the images. When you go about a simple uh, daily activities, you have to go through uh, checkpoints. You have to surrender your ID. And if your ID uh, is identified as untrustworthy, that you will be prevented from entering the a uh, place of uh, common areas, schools, hospitals, shopping malls. At the same time, they have a two, I will show you the image, they have a two lane, one for the Han Chinese, one for the ethnic Uyghurs. So uh, Jim Millward, the uh, Georgetown University professor, has a very nice piece on this, using the Imagine um, uh, to describe how this uh, uh, police state, the surveillance state set up. It's affecting everybody's life. Uh, recently, we have seen the images of the Chinese police coming to the doors of Uyghur families, scanning the CQ codes. Um, I have an image that I can show you as well. And, and when you talk to the uh, Uyghur uh, diaspora today, uh, over 90% of the Uyghurs can tell you that they are completely cut off from their family members. Simply why, the reason is that the Chinese government has this software, compulsory software that you must install on your phone. So any foreign contacts, text messages, voice messages, phone calls, if identified, that could result in uh, some unthinkable consequences. On top of that, they also uh, engage in, in massive data, personal data collection, DNA sampling. Um, DNA sampling, uh, initially the uh, uh, DNA sequencer, the machine, was provided by this company called Thermo Fisher Technologies based in Massachusetts. 
it came to our attention in 2018, uh, Senator Marco Rubio, Human Rights Watch, uh, went after this company. They stopped selling DNA sequencers to Xinjiang government, but you don't know if they can sell it in other provinces and then it still makes it too. So this DNA sampling is one of the puzzling uh, issues that I don't think that anyone were able to provide a coherent, uh, reasonable answer to. So uh, when they were collecting DNA samples, the, uh, the way that they enticed people to give samples were that they were uh, providing free uh, physical checkup. So they did not know that the blood was drawn with that specific purpose. But one of the most jarring aspect of this whole uh, tech surveillance is the IJOP. Uh, in Chinese, it's Yi Ti Hua Xitong, Integrated Joint Operating Platform. So that, it, it, this, is, this, is the, uh, this is how people are being round up. Um, in the um, um, released documents, leaked documents called China Cables, uh, released by ICIJ, uh, there's some information which is basically in 10 days in 2017, uh, IJOP, uh, identify 25,000 individuals, the Uyghurs, to be rounded up. Of that 25,000 people, the police were able to identify or locate 16,000. Their, their uh, superiors, they don't like it. We have 25,000 people because there was a quota. Those officials must meet the quota to round up people. They were upset and they did additional search. So they identified additional 700 people. So that 10 days period in late June, early July in 2017, with the help of IJOP, uh, the Chinese were able to uh, arrest 16,700 people in 10 days. But no one asked any question if that was, the, if that was an effective method. So that was not the concern. They were so keen to meet the criteria or quota that was set by the Chinese officials. So um, one of the revealing aspect of this, for some reason, the uh, Human Rights Watch uh, managed to get hold of the software. They reverse engineered. I'll show you the uh, specifics of it uh, as we go along. So this is how they stop you on the street. Uh, random check. I, uh, your phones. Uh, we, I, this is, this is an un, uh, unconfirmed information, but uh, back in 2017 and 2018, even if you use dumb phone, not the smartphone, that could get the official's attention because that's not trackable. So they want you to use smartphone so that they can check. Um, the uh, facial recognition, yeah, you may say that it's all over the place and it's ubiquitous in, in, you know, if you go to anywhere in China. True. But there's a misconception about this technology. Some people think that it's been uh, tested only in Xinjiang and now using it in other places. But I think it, it's both. The in, that, uh, initial R&D was done in the uh, uh, in, inland provinces, but actual usage and successful testing, and now exportation actually is happening in the Uyghur region. So this is the mobile police station. Uh, 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 it, the Economist magazine published this. They had some reporters manage to go to the region. Based on that uh, image on the back, I can tell this is uh, the capital city, Rimchi. That's the uh, uh, government building. So, and then as you go through, you have to go to police check. Um, there's a different line for the Chinese and the Uyghur people. Um, and this is a market in my uh, old neighborhood, neighborhood in Kashgar. It's an international market they used to have people from all over uh, in Eurasia, Central Asia, to do business. Just to get into the market, they have to go through this process, one by one. ID and iris scan. This is a neighborhood. They have this kind of check uh, point. So when you hear it, it doesn't make any sense. You know, it's like, it's hard to believe that these kind of things are happening in 2019, 20, 2000 you know, 2018 to uh, 2019, but this is the actual images. Um, the Darren Baylor, the guy who's credited in this picture, was in the region early 2019. This is the pictures from him, a scholar at the University of Washington. And there's another image. Uh, so, 
so this is effectively, these kind of things were already in place before they set up the concentration camps. So this is like the, the Uyghur lady is going through a metal detector, uh, even going to the market, you have to go through this. Look at the cameras, this is a school. Uh, it looks like elementary school. Uh, I, I can count four cameras. Uh, this is my hometown, ancestral hometown, Kashgar. Um, I can help you to count two. Just in that small area, there's seven cameras. This is an old city in Kashgar. Um, and you can see the flags. They're just forcing this patriotic sense of patriotism while oppressing and locking up people in the concentration camps. Um, even the uh, knives have a barcode. Uh, so that they can identify if it's been misused. Um, and then this is the, uh, the barcode Q, QR code that I was referencing to at the doors of uh, 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 individual home doors. And this is how they collect uh, uh, personal data. Every family had to fill out this form. Uh, if you look at it, it says, frequently pray and venue, home or mosque or other. Um, Initially, uh, everyone was willing to provide uh, personal information, uh, thinking that they have to do this, but the government used this when they were um, setting up the um, uh, people who should round it up. So, so this is the uh, reverse engineering, uh, reverse engineered uh, program uh, by the uh, Human Rights Watch. They uh, managed to get hold of the um, uh, the software, uh, they have a report if you're interested, there's a comprehensive report about this. So one of the th interesting things that they were identify is that even if you, uh, if you use too much electricity, if you have a really high electric bill, that could get you in trouble. That shows that you're doing something uh, like spending too much time online, talking too much on the phone, you're not supposed to confide with someone. And also, the Uyghurs don't have the back door that much. They, you know, the Uyghur homes are pretty simple. They usually have a very fancy front door, and uh, most Uyghurs now live in the buildings. But if you leave and enter the house through the back door, that could be also a reason for you to be picked up. This was part of the... Uh, um, they asked you blood type. Uh, this is... Um, um, this is how it looks when they have the actual uh, profile of... Um, and now the, the facial recognition, without even the uh, names and place of birth, date of birth, blood type, by facial, uh, facial structure, uh, uh, eye color, shape of the eyes, can identify if that person is Uyghur or not. So this is a typical um, um, uh, it, a machine that they uh, collect personal data. And now recently, uh, we found out they also installing uh, uh, this this kind of um, surveillance machines at the entrance to the church. Uh, this is the image provided by uh, Italy-based uh, news group called Bitter Winters. So the, the tech oppression, repression, is not only staying at, within the borders of China. So they're using the same method, the WeChat, to export or reaching to the shores of the United States and Canada elsewhere. So what they do is to um, reach out to the Uyghurs. Uh, most of the messages still comes through to the Uyghur communities uh, via me, uh, WeChat. So either uh, tell them to be, uh, uh, tell them to stay quiet or stay away from any political activities. Even sometimes when this kind of political event, we, we don't see enough Uyghur faces, uh, particularly in countries like Canada and um, uh, Australia, where the government has not been, have not been strong or taken a strong position. Uh, and the, the Uyghur residents don't feel comfortable showing up because they feel that there, no one is protecting them. Even attending this kind of event, sometimes uh, pressured um, or prevented through that kind of personal messaging from the uh, Chinese intelligence officers. And then the second thing that they do, the second type of thing that they do is to uh, prevent a threat, harass Uyghur family members 
uh, of the, uh, uh, the camp detainees to stay quiet. So if you disclose this information, if you talk uh, in public, then we will look for additional uh, family members to send to the camp. And finally, they uh, try to recruit Uyghur informants here in Canada, Australia, and the United States, and then Europe. So it's a very uh, effective method for the Chinese. What they do is to harass them, uh, some, in some instances provide incentives, just like the way that they do with Han Chinese students around the country, uh, even. Uh, and then they have no choice. They said, okay, if you don't harm my family, I will tell so-and-so uh, doing you know, ABCD type of political activities. The U.S. government is investigating this. There's an active uh, uh, legislation in the U.S. Congress. Actually, it has a provision about uh, law enforcement uh, keeping an eye on the harassment of the Uyghur residents in the United States. So what do we do about... Um, so this is the latest. They can track the Muslim uh, facial uh, appearance. Uh, they can track the Muslim individuals through the uh, technology that they have. This is most recent uh, uh, information being released. So what are the companies uh, that aiding abating the Chinese government? The the, the most uh, widely discussed one is obviously Huawei, uh, Hikvision, ZTE, uh, Dahua. Uh, Hikvision is um, something that I think worth noting. Uh, they are uh, the maker, uh, provider of world, uh, one third of world's security cameras. It's not a common here in, the United, uh, in, in North America, but if you go to developing countries, the conference room, the classrooms, uh, I don't know about these cameras, but uh, Hikvision uh, cameras, are, cameras are ubiquitous uh, in developing countries because it's cheaper than the ones made uh, in West, in the United States in particular. And, and then uh, recently we find out that uh, American Pension Fund is investing in Hake Vision. So uh, we need to pay attention to these companies uh, that are already part of our lives here in the West. <clears throat> So in response to these um, uh, tech surveillance, the dystopian surveillance and oppression of the Uyghurs, the United States government blacklisted 28 uh, Chinese entities uh, last year. So that 28 entities include 18 police departments. And this was the first time that the US government applied this law uh, based on the human rights concern. So this would uh, cause a huge damage to the health of the Chinese tech industry. So this, there are some, some of the companies that they used uh, for surveillance. I mentioned uh, Hick Vision, artificial intelligence, the sense time is also uh, have investors in the West, uh, in North America. Uh, Xiamen Meya uh, that uh, initially was developed for forensic, uh, but now it's used for um, uh, tech surveillance. Um, so here's, here's the Hikvision cameras. Uh, actually, you can buy them in Amazon on Amazon. Uh, it's available. Here's the uh, uh, Amazon uh, shopping list that you can uh, even buy it. So, um, as I always said, that people still have not really recognized the danger of these uh, equipments. Even before this tech surveillance and threat to democratic principles come to um, or become a part of a discussion, the Uyghur residents were very of this uh, uh, cameras and the cable box in the house, even the telephones provided by telephone companies. Um, it turned out to be a, a right approach especially that the cable box that they have in each house, uh, believed to be bugged. So what is the US tech companies are doing in support of these uh, surveillance uh, state? Um, none of the major tech companies uh, publicly acknowledge any wrongdoing, but the, uh, much of the Chinese uh, surveillance technology rely on the software and the hardware that comes from the West. 
This is precisely why that every time when uh, export control comes up, they become crazy. Their actions, their reactions, and their uh, public statements are so illustrative that as if they get hit where it hurts. Um, when the Huawei ZTE issue being discussed in Washington, Financial Times reported that um, some tech uh, experts, engineers, uh, were stating that if the United States stopped providing software, providing the hardware to be able to continue to support uh, their existing uh, handheld devices, uh, it will cause a huge damage, even lead to a, could lead to a bankruptcy. As a result, you can, you will, I mean, this is so disturbing that some of the major U.S. Uh, former politicians and, and influential people uh, have been lobbying for uh, China's tech giants. Uh, John Boehner, for example, former Speaker of the House, uh, apparently lobbying uh, for on behalf of Huawei. Uh, former Vice President presidential candidate Joe Lieberman is lobbying for ZTE. So they have an army of uh, law firms and lawyers lobbying to counter uh, these efforts. Um, so let's move on to the um, more uh, focused concern. So what is digital um, So what is the digital authoritarianism? Uh, digital authoritarianism is the, uh, the, the regime uh, uses to monitor, surveil, and repress a certain population. Is this only exclusive to China? You may think that uh, China is not the only one, and then I agree with you. Uh, but other countries, even the United States and Canada, do this uh, surveillance uh, to the extent, especially after 9-11. But is that... Uh, threatening a democratic system and liberty, yes, to the extent. But the purpose of the China's way and the Russian way of uh, uh, developing, uh, testing, and exporting the digital, uh, uh, digital or tech authoritarianism is something that people should start paying attention. Because we've already seen how it works. Uh, just looking at the, uh, uh, the process and the current setup that the Chinese government has in the Uyghur region. So um, why should you be concerned? Eventually, this will affect the lives of everyone. Uh, give me, uh, let me give you uh, an example. So if you look at, um, if you look at the type of countries um, that are listed on this slide, um, uh, the Human Rights, uh, excuse me, the Freedom House and others have uh, profiled uh, several um, uh, profile several countries that have been actively in negotiation with the Chinese government. So what, what they identify is that uh, initially it was uh, a, a, uh, just a tech-related negotiation, buying equipment, but now the China is selling it as part of its uh, BRI Belt and Road Initiative package. So the financial aid, technical support, training, manuals, everything is a package. So some of these countries are not a Jeffersonian de democracy, but I was appalled to see a Germany in that list. I was concerned when the New Zealand police were trained by the Chinese police. I was concerned when the, uh, during the protest, the Hong Kong police were trained by Xinjiang police. And I'm also very concerned that uh, Turkish judges, prosecutors being trained by the Chinese, police, uh, Chinese counterparts. So there is a trend. Uh, so the Chinese government, uh, like, you know, the Russians uh, uh, meddle in the democratic process, but the Chinese are trying to create this new system, uh, the tech surveillance, to identify even who is voting who. Uh, the ID identification guard technology have been quickly adopted by Venezuela, Pakistan, even Turkey. Uh, they use the same technology. So in the future, uh, we have to deal with a new type of oppression resulting from these kind of uh, tech surveillance uh, that have been promoted by the Chinese government. The, um, if you look, um, they're, they're also affecting the how media and an information management has been. 
Um, they even trying to affect the process and practices of multilateral institutions like the UN, trying to uh, promote their model. Um, uh, there's a documentary in Frontline uh, uh, recently. Uh, there's a um, uh, memorable line. It says, we cannot avoid a technology becoming even more involved in our lives, affecting our privacy, but the surveillance is helping the authoritarian regime more so than democratic nations. So this should give us a pause and, and think about what should we do uh, to counter uh, the spread of digital authoritarianism uh, developed and now promoted by China and Russia to be uh, specific. So uh, what do we do about this uh, in a pol on a policy level? Um, the Canada has Magnitsky, Magnitsky law, Sergei Magnitsky law, that's the, the name. Uh, it was enacted in 2017. Um, the Canada should look into some of the tech giants uh, and hum th that are assisting the Chinese state with the ongoing human rights abuses uh, in Xinjiang, uh, in East Turkestan, or Tibet, or overall China. There's an available legal tools that the, uh, the can Canadian government uh, could consider using. And then the other thing is that relatively easy but has not been done. At the UN uh, Human Rights Council there are, uh, you only need 16 uh, country to sponsor an emergency session. Uh, to this day on the face of these atrocities, this horrible uh, condition, uh, hellish life that the Chinese authorities created for the Uyghur people, no country, uh, no current or uh, former heads of state said anything publicly. It has been uh, relatively mute, particularly in Europe. Uh, they have been making mildest uh, forms of requests. Even when you look at the recommendations that you're seeing, they're so mundane. You know, no one is asking to break the diplomatic tie with PRC. What we have been asking is to say, look, there's a real danger. Even if you're not concerned about the Uyghur people, and how they've been treated. It is a matter of conscience. It's about how you value the existing democratic system. Uh, the Chinese government has been uh, a revisionist power uh, in this particular matter. Uh, they have been uh, very open, and they have been buying out silence, and they've been turning some weaker countries into a client state, and, and the world seemed to be doing nothing uh, to counter that. And also, um, the universities has a huge responsibility in this whole process. Uh, DNA collection, uh, tech survey development. Uh, some of the US uh, universities have been implicated, particularly one professor uh, at Yale Law, uh, Medical School uh, by the name Kenneth uh, Kidd, uh, initially assisted uh, collecting the Uyghur DNA and also share that with uh, a, a, a self-claimed scientist who were an employee of the Minister of Public Security. So there's some uh, crazy things happened in the past, but there's also a way to correct that. And also, the, um, um, I'm not, I cannot claim to be an expert on how Canadian government is handling uh, China affairs or its foreign policy dealing with the technology issues, but. I think every country should have uh, export control measurements uh, in place. Even if they have one uh, already uh, being applied and utilized, they should look at uh, new ones. Because we're dealing with the new issues. Uh, in the United States, the Congress is currently have three bills. And one of them specifically addresses the, um, uh, the export control issue. Uh, this might be sound very hefty idea, but Canadian Parliament should have a Uyghur Policy Act in support of their fellow Canadian citizens. Um, I cannot have the exact figure, but there's a sizable Uyghur population, mainly in three provinces, BC, Alberta, and Ontario, uh, and then uh, Quebec. So uh, there's a reason, this is a, both for, uh, based on moral reason and national security reason. I think Canadian government should have a clear and coherent, uh, applicable uh, legislative mandate so that when you have a new prime minister, they don't have to uh, you know, play politics, they have to have something to follow. This is precisely what we're trying to accomplish in the United States. You know, one president comes, leaves, just like the Tibetan uh, uh, cause, 
it does, you cannot even tell the difference uh, if there's a change of government. So each, because we're dealing with this humanitarian crisis, this uh, threat to our democracy, uh, to rule of law, uh, privacy, and free speech, we need to find a way to have a, a new um, a coherent uh, policy initiatives. So in, as an individual, what can you do? Um, you can ask your um, uh, prime minister uh, to at least uh, talk about Uyghurs publicly uh, for a change. I, you know, he, he likes to talk about uh, popular issues. Um, he likes to be on everybody's side. And this is the only side that he has not been. So I'm sorry if I sound very critical of your prime minister, but you know, um, we have to be honest with each other. Uh, he has not done anything. Uh, the cl closest statement, public statement he said, uh, was in uh, New York when he was uh, interviewed at the Council on Foreign Relations. He said he talks about human rights privately with Chinese leaders. Mm -hmm. Fine. Um, so, so that has to change. So you can change this. You know, unlike the United States, you have a different government system. I think you have much better chance of making him to f uh, talk. We don't have, because we have you know, Congress, different entities, uh, you know, different method, but th there's a good chance that you might be able to make the government take a stand. But let me also point out the can can Canadian government, even though Prime Minister has been sort of uh, tiptoeing around the issue, the government itself uh, has been supportive. Uh, back in 2018, Canada spearheaded um, a joint request uh, to visit the camps. Uh, by the ambassadors, uh, 15 country uh, representatives in Beijing to go to the region to visit. And also last September, Canada co-hosted a side event uh, on the occasion of UN General Assembly. So th th something has been taking place, but uh, on the face of this, uh, uh, considering the magnitude of the scope of the issue, I think Canadian government could definitely do more. Uh, and also um, as an individual, I, 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 I ask you to consider writing an op-ed. Even after this event, if you have any thoughts that you wanted to share with people, I think writing op-ed uh, is very helpful. Because at the end of the day, that more people knows about what's happening, uh, the better for us to have a governmental action. So the governmental action can be uh, individual or collective. Uh, the boat is not big enough for Chinese government to change its behavior. Um, uh, when I talk about the U.S. government's actions, sometimes it conveys wrong message, that as if that I'm promoting uh, US, uh, U.S. government's position or trying to justify it, but it's a fact. The United States government is the only government uh, that has been a vocal and specific uh, with some real actions, uh, legislative initiatives. It is what it is, so we have to acknowledge that, and it's not too difficult for other countries, just like the way that previous uh, global issues handled collectively. We have to be, we have to be able to uh, uh, bring nations together so that the, uh, the damage or retaliation against a particular state will be less as opposed to dealing with that uh, giant power uh, individually. And also there's a new campaign uh, recently been launched, uh, launched um, whenever I, when I think of the Chinese, uh, uh, the Olympics uh, in 2008, 2008 and 2022, uh, 1936 uh, Berlin Olympics come to mind. Um, that should not happen. I'm not calling for right out boycotting Olympics, but the Olympic Committee, as requested by several senators in the United States Senate, should revisit their contracts with the Chinese government. They should, you know, they, the Chinese people and the country deserves their rightful place in the international community, but they should not let this happen uh, and just go on with uh, Chinese officials and government as business usual um, in light of what's happening. So they can revisit, um, they can use the athletes to pressure, so it's a simple message that we cannot have this Olympic as we agreed in this contract that allowed you to have the uh, 2022 Olympics when you were locking up more than 20% of your own citizens. We have seen this before, 1936, that's how Hitler glorified his uh, regime. 
Um, so we should not let the history repeat itself again. And also, since this is a university, I should also mention something that um, uh, back in 2018, uh, a, a Uyghur uh, experts, uh, mostly uh, the, uh, the professors and, uh, and Xinjiang scholars in the United States, um, uh, mobilized over 700 scholars worldwide. Uh, that letter invitation, uh, the signature is still open. I invite you to uh, visit. And if you wanted to find out where to find that document, I'd be more than happy to do it. But um, it, it's a pretty simple thing. And also, I, um, um, as if you're a student, um, use your uh, student uh, associations, like student groups, to organize events like this. You know, um, I, I am... Uh, I'm getting increasingly impatient uh, because we have not been able to close the camps. But when you look at the positive side uh, from where we were uh, three years ago or two years ago to where we are today, it's a breathtaking uh, development. Um, this past April, I was um, speaking at Council on Foreign Relations with a uh, um, civil rights lawyer, uh, Gay McDougall, uh, who was uh, at the uh, uh, UN uh, panel, uh, Elimination of Racial Discrimination, she fought uh, for civil rights her entire life. And when I was sounded very uh, depressed, she said, Nuri, I, I've been doing this in the last 40, 50 years. Um, i never seen anything making this quick progress. So there's something to be happy about. Uh, the fact that I'm here talking to you um, is also a uh, testimony to the fact that people start paying attention. So um, with that, I'd like to stop here. Uh, so um, I am happy and, and ready to take any questions that Helen might be able to collect. I think there were some cards that were being passed around. Okay. So uh, I need to mention, um, you know, I, uh, a couple of things that you could also do. Uh, if somebody said, um, just a family conversation or social engagement, ask your friends to Google Uyghurs. Very simple thing. Just one quick Google will find a lot of first-hand information. I know you can also ask uh, your friends to visit our website, uhrp.org. It's part of my email address there. Uh, or just follow me on Twitter. I have a lot of useful information that you could... Okay. Okay. Yes. You want me to read them? Yes. Okay, number one. If assimilation of the Uyghurs is China's end game, what is the end game of the Uyghur community in China? Independence? Oh, well, we have it again today. <laughs> we have a slightly different audience. Yeah, um, that is the most difficult question to address. Um, here's why. One, it's impossible to find out what people want inside China because we, have a, we are in a situation where the Uyghur people cannot say they are Muslim. Uh, recently, uh, an Albanian uh, scholar who managed to be part of the uh, uh, Potemkin village visits paid by the Chinese government. Uh, his video messages are available. Uh, his name is Olsi Yazaji. Uh, he was very anti-American. He think that the American uh, government is is messing around the world and killing Muslims and he's a Muslim being Muslim, he had no affection for the US government. So he was trying to figure out if this was this propaganda made by the United States or created by the United States. So he went there and tried to have a conversation with the DNEs selected by the officials during the visit. So some simple questions, uh, are you Muslim, could not be properly answered. It's very revealing. If a person, uh, part of an ethnic group, uh, practicing Islamic faith since 13th century, could not say that she is a Muslim, and she's refused to speak Uyghur, afraid of being in trouble with the people who are watching. This is all available on YouTube. I'd be more than happy to share that with you. The reason that I'm bringing this up, that's, this is a, a revealing uh, situation that it's impossible to have people to tell you what they want. But if you ask people outside of China, 
I can guarantee you that more than 80%, maybe categorically, systematically, you will hear one word. We had enough with them. They are killing us. Mm -hmm. It will be false errand to think that we can still stay in this marriage. So it depends who you ask. So, but, but what the Uyghurs are facing today is an existential threat. This is why always, I always use the phrase uh, to describe the Uyghurs are canaries in a coal mine. Um, so if, if this continues, the Chinese win, their proud culture, language, uh, national identity, ethnic identity will be stamped out. If the Chinese government fails, they are not going to release all those millions of people to the street. We're talking about three million people at least in one of the camps, there are different type of camps. So if you ask my uh, honest opinion about what the Uyghurs want, they just wanted to uh, uh, save the nation first and then talk about the other political issues. But the China has, this, uh, has a, a period throughout history uh, that there was no violence, that the people seemed to be very happy, particularly in the 80s. They should go back and revisit uh, their policy during that period to see if this if it provides them a soft landing or cushion for them to return to. Okay, next question. Because Tibetans have gone through and continue to go through similar experiences as the Uyghur people, for example, prison camps, checkpoints, the segregation of Tibetans from non-Tibetans, has there been much solidarity between Uyghurs and Tibetan people? Can this relationship be leveraged to help advance the Uyghur cause? It's a great question. Um, um, the short answer is no. Um, very, uh, very uh, disappointingly, um, one might hope that uh, because of the similar uh, experience, uh, similar um, destination, um, the Tibetans prob uh, would be the first to come to defend the Uyghurs in international communities around the world. Uh, to this day, we have not heard Dalai Lama or the Tibetan government in exile, uh, the top official Lapsang Sangai publicly uh, said anything in support of the Uyghurs. But the International Campaign for Tibet uh, published an open letter uh, supporting the uh, Uyghur Policy Act in the US Congress. But what we have been seeing, m m the support is from the Hong Kong community. The Hong Kong uh, protesters uh, organized a separate protest in support of the Uyghurs. And also they have been speaking out uh, when they talk about their experience. There are very similarities. You know, the Uyghurs were also given that kind of autonomy in 1950. There's a beautifully written autonomy law. If the Chinese government followed the autonomy law, followed its criminal procedure, followed its even counterterrorism law, we probably have different world for both Chinese people and the Uyghur people. Okay, next question. How would you analyze parallels between the Turkish government's treatment of the Kurds and the Chinese government's treatment of the Uyghurs? That, that uh, comparison oftentimes um, is a common uh, rebuttal by the Chinese government. I, I don't think there's a, um, it, it's not an apple and orange comparison. Um, it's not even similar. Uh, the closest case for the Uyghurs, probably the Tibetans, the rest of them are a part of the uh, uh, Chinese government's public statement. And they use that to um, keep the Turkish government silent because they said, oh, if you support the Uyghurs, we will support the Kurds. But um, I'm not here to defend the Turkish government, but I'd like to point out a few facts. Turkish, Turkey had um, presidents over the years, uh, including the current one, at least two of them are half Kurdish. The second president of the Turkish Republic, Ismet Ünününü, uh, and Turgut Özel, uh, were half Kurdish. In the current Kurdish parliament, a uh, Turkish parliament, I was told that there are over, uh, there are over 100 Kurdish parliamentarians. Uh, and I cannot imagine that the PRC would allow half Uyghur, half Tibetan to be the president of PRC. And I, I cannot even think that would be a possibility. And I cannot think that there will be 100 MPs uh, in the Chinese parliament, even if it's a rubber stamp. So uh, it's not a really good comparison. Could you elaborate on what characteristics make the Uyghur the object of Chinese oppression? Is it religious and cultural differences or a desire to exploit the resources on Uyghur territory? 
Um, under what conditions would the Chinese government be satisfied and go away? Do Uyghurs want to separate? Well, we have, we've talked about that. So, so can you, in, in your mind, what are the main reasons for this oppression? I think all of the above. All of the above. Um, the, when you look at the policy statements, um, the uh, New York Times revelation uh, tells you a lot about um, why they ratcheted up since 2014. They formulated policies for almost two years from 2014 to 16, but much of their focus is on stability. Um, the Chinese government uh, formulates policies based on the perceived threat, but not an actual threat. Yes, there were some violent incidents during that period, but before Xi Jinping uh, launched this current repressive policies, it was already quite, uh, it was already been uh, tackled properly. When you, timing is very important in politics. 2016 to 18, there was nothing. But yet they still uh, set up these policies. But to me, um, someone who is full blood Uyghur, I think uh, the Uyghurs' uh, ethno national identity, <coughs> religious practices, and being different uh, were uh, some of the key factors for the Chinese to come up with these policies. Because they openly say, you know, I grew up here in this, Uyghurs are different. Being different is bad. Therefore, they have to be transformed. When you look at the propaganda uh, official lines, the statements you hear, this transformation, thought transformation. So being Uyghur in of itself is a virus. This is also in the revelation, the uh, leaked documents. They call it thought viruses. So what does that mean? So if you speak this different language, if you look different, if you adhere to different diet, uh, if you uh, have a different preference for your marriage, that in of itself uh, gets you into trouble with the Chinese. So there are lots of races. Uh, some people may disagree, and I respect that, uh, and you should disagree uh, with, with my, my views. But the fact, the official statements, uh, their propaganda lines, uh, help you to understand what they really try to do, which is trying to, uh, which is to eliminate the Uyghurs uh, centuries of ethno-national identity that the Chinese government perceives as a uh, future political threat. And just to continue on, Marie, do you think, though, you mentioned that there were the golden period of the 1980s and then everything changed. Is, is that connected, though, to the natural resources? Um, yes. Um, there were two reasons for uh, Chinese governments to uh, uh, start um, uh, ratcheting up uh, their policies. One is the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union. They, uh, uh, Professor Sean Roberts at uh, GW, uh, George Washington University have written about this, he's a Central Asian expert. Uh, there was a uh, awakening, it was an awakening for the Chinese officials a, we don't want this to be this region to be balkanized, and two, we don't want to be end up like the Soviet Union. So they they not only domestically uh, tighten up their um, control, they also use their geopolitical uh, influence uh, with the help of uh, uh, Putin's Russia to set up this uh, organization called Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the SEO. The SEO's main sub, uh, main objective is to uh, maintain domestic security for the member states. For the China, it's uh, maintaining external security because there's a sizable Uyghur population on the other side of the border. So this coincides with what happened in the 90s. And then the other thing is that, uh, that they start, um, uh, because of the SEO establishment, because of China's growing influence, and later entering to WTO and having active trade, they wanted to secure that land mass to the market in Europe, market in Euro-Asia, and also access to natural resources, not only in the region, but also in Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan. Now they're in Iraq. They are a major oil um, the client. Uh, highlighting one important point, the, the, the Uyghur region is not only uh, rich for uh, natural resources, vegetables and fruit, it's also um, a major uh, natural gas uh, uh, providing region to the Chinese. So people in Beijing and Shanghai, 
use the natural gas coming from the Uyghur religion. So the Uyghurs are both cursed and blessed. Cursed because they have they sit on a precious piece of territory. They're blessed if they had a, a, a normal life, you would have been a prosperous uh, country uh, or region, if you will. Some people liken it to uh, California, mm-hmm. has everything, uh, the nice weather, mountains. And Beautiful. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, we've come to the end. Uh, thank you very much. And I want to thank everyone for coming, but I particularly want to ask you to join me to thank our speaker. Thank you so much.